What's up everybody, today we're going to be going through how to make your first animation in Blender. First things first, I'm giving away this chicken character rig for free. MoGraph Mentor created a landing page for it and they're helping me promote it. You need to have an account to download it. The account's free. You can opt out of the newsletter if you're not interested. However, I do sometimes write articles about Blender for MoGraph Mentor. So if you're interested, stay for that. If you want something even more basic, I've also included this little ball bounce with a face so that you can use that to follow along with making your first animation. First, we'll do a quick overview of the animation interface in Blender for those that have never used it before. And then after that, we're going to go through this simple ball bouncing animation and kind of the basics of polishing up our keyframes. So this is great if it's your first time animating. This video will cover everything you need to get started with animation in Blender, but these are actually two lesson videos pulled from my Skillshare class. They stand on their own as a full tutorial, but if if you're interested in a deep dive into animation or learning more complex animation, check out my course, link in the description below. I'll walk you through from start to finish how to make this entire animation here with this little chicken bouncing. But for now, let's take a look at how to animate in Blender. Blender is such a big program that each section could have its own interface video. And we're gonna deep dive into the animation interface and some of the tools that we'll be using throughout this course, specifically the dope sheet editor, which allows us to move the keyframes of our object and the graph editor, which allows us to affect the easing between those keyframes. Now, if you don't know what that means, there's a section of this course where we learn how to animate a ball bounce before diving into our character. And we'll go through some of the basics there. So here we are in the chicken walk cycle animation project file. And we'll use this for our animation deep dive. I've included a couple animations I did with this character rig. So after finishing the chicken jump animation, if you wanna go ahead and kind of see how I created the other animations, you can reference these project files. So here we'll see that it is playing. If yours is playing slower, you may not be able to run the animation at full speed, just if you're on a lower end machine, you can look up here and see what frame rate it's playing at. It should be around 24, because that's what we'll be animating at. I'm gonna go ahead and pause here, and that's where you can play and stop, and you can also play in reverse, and that can help you identify animation problems. Here, this will snap you to the front and back of your timeline. You can adjust the length of that timeline over here with the start and the end kind of property feels there. So if we go ahead and do 22, you can see that now the animation will stop at frame 22. This will also determine what's going to render out when you click render, and we'll be covering that more in the render video. Down here, you'll see that I have these markers here, and I use these as kind of references, and you can create markers by just hovering down here and pressing M, and those can kind of be helpful for marking where you're at in an animation and using that as a reference. So that's down here in the timeline. We also have this auto keying option. And when we click that, what it will do is as we move forward in our animation, if I grab this leg and I rotate this leg forward here, you'll see that it automatically inserts a keyframe. So that's how auto keying works. Now, if you don't have auto keying on, so if I turn that off and I move it, and then I move forward, we'll see that it snaps back to whatever keyframe it's referencing before. So if I wanted to move this forward and insert a keyframe, I would have that object selected and I would press I and it would let me choose what I wanted to insert a keyframe into. So if in that case it was rotation, I could go ahead and insert a rotation keyframe and you'll see that now that leg stays there. So I'm just going to undo that for now. Now, if I turn back on auto keying, Whenever we move, it's going to insert a keyframe. Let me go over here to the graph editor so you can see how messy this gets really quickly. You can see that it inserts a keyframe on everything, the location, the rotation, and the scale, but all we did is rotate it. So you can see how this turns into just a giant spaghetti monster and becomes really messy. So one thing you can do is you can come over here to this keying tab. You can click keying here and they have keying sets. So if we click this set, you can have all these different options here. So if I choose rotation and I have rotation there, and then I come over here to the auto keying and I turn on only active keying set, making sure that's checked on. Then when I do an animation change, it will only add that keyframe into the keying set, in this case, rotation. So we could go around and animate and it would only insert rotation keyframes. Now I know that may seem confusing right now, but I promise that as we use it later in practice, it will make sense, especially when we get into our simple animation with the ball bounce. So that's kind of how the timeline works down here. 
Let's talk about the viewport here. So you see that I'm grabbing all these bones and moving my character. And how am I doing that? So you can see here that I can't select the object and that's because we're in a mode called pose mode. So if you followed along with me earlier, you can hold tab and switch between object mode and pose mode. And I'll explain those differences in a moment. Right now we're in pose mode. You can tell what mode we're in by this top left field up here. You can also change it up here as well if you don't want to use the tab key. So let's go over to object mode. So in Blender, let me rotate out here into the view. An object is like any object in the viewport. So here, this wall is an object, but if we click this chicken, we can see that almost the entire chicken is put inside of one object. So if I tab into edit mode, you can see I have several pieces in there. So if you've ever used Adobe Animate or really old school Adobe Flash, or if you've used Adobe Illustrate or After Effects, an object's almost like a composition or a movie symbol or like a group. You can put a bunch of things in it. So that's how you select different objects in object mode. But you'll notice that if we grab this, which is called our armature, which are the bones of our character, which is what we use to animate our character, you can see that it grabs it as one. We can't grab the arm and animate just the arm. So to adjust all these bones inside of our armature, we have to tab into pose mode, or you can come up here. So we can go to object and select pose mode. And now we can grab all these bones and animate our character. Now I know that may seem a bit overwhelming at the moment, but we're going to have a video where we go through this entire character rig and how to play with all the bones. So just stick with it and we'll definitely dive into that a bit more later. Let's take a look at this window over here. So when I had it open, I had it open with a dope sheet here. So if you've never animated before or never heard of animating before and how they work with keyframes, every one of these is a keyframe. So a keyframe is a stored point of data along the timeline where it will then take from this keyframe and whatever keyframes next and we'll try and animate next to that. So let's go ahead, tab here into pose mode here and let's grab something that doesn't have as many keyframes. So this arm right here. And let's look at this arm. So we can see here that we have this keyframe here and we can see the position of the arm there is down. And then if we go all the way forward here to eight, we can see that the position of the arm is up. So we can see that it animates from down to up. And the way I did that is by inserting a keyframe. So if I go here and I change this keyframe, so I'm gonna turn on Auto King. If I change this keyframe to be up, we'll now see that it stays up the whole time. If we go ahead and we animate this keyframe down and maybe forward, we'll see that it will animate from that position to up. You can see here that I have one keyframe before it, and because there's no room to animate in between, since it just goes one, two, it just snaps from one to the next. So that's the basics of how a keyframe works. Now the speed of how it goes from two to eight is dependent on the graph, and we'll dive into that a bit later. That's called easing, so just keep that term in mind. So you can see here that we have all the keyframes down in here in the timeline, and only the keyframes that are appearing are of these selected objects. So if I go ahead and select another object or another object here, we'll see more keyframes appearing. So if I select one object, I can grab those keyframes down here and you can just click and drag that to move that around or you can press the G key to grab and move that around just like we learned with the objects in the viewport. So you can see how we can kind of move and edit our keyframes there. We can also delete them down here by just pressing the delete key and it'll give us this option here and we can click delete keyframes. So we can remove keyframes down there as well. And anytime we move with auto key on or press I, you'll see that we get a new keyframe. So I'm just gonna go ahead and undo that. So you may be wondering why we need this dope sheet when we have this timeline down here that we can move the keys. And truth be told, with our animation and keeping it simple, we'll mostly be working down here. But up here at the dope sheet, you can see that I can see all the keyframes for every object in the scene, and that's where this can be really useful. There's also the option up here, only show selected. So if we click that, it'll kind of clean up that view and only show you the selected object like down here. So let's go back and turn that off so we can see all the objects. The other reason this is useful is that we can see all the different properties. So if I turn on only selected, and we can see that I have this bone selected here, which is arm left, and I twirl that down, we can see that we can see the location keyframes, the rotation keyframes, 
and the scale keyframes. And you can't see all of that down here. So if I go ahead and if you pay attention to this keyframe here, so that correlates to this one, if I grab this one and move it, you can see it moves all of those. And here you can see that if I wanted, I could move just the rotation keyframes, or I could even offset those rotation keyframes. So that can be really useful when you start getting into really detailed animation. Now for this course, we're going to be keeping it simple and we'll mostly be just kind of moving the high level stuff. And you can click the top keyframe there. So the one above the arm L there, if I click that one, you see that it'll select everything in and then you can click and drag those to move them. Or if you want, you can box select. So you can box select and grab a bunch and you can move those around that way too. So that's kind of how selection moves there. Again, I know some of this can seem overwhelming, but I promise we're gonna keep it simple in this course and we won't necessarily need to do all of these little kind of intricacies. So that's how we can work with the dope sheet up here. If we go back, we can see that we can see all of our keyframes. So we could box select multiple objects at once if we wanted. So if we wanted to grab everything in the hip and the body and move those, we could do that. Likewise earlier, how I clicked everything in the body, if I click there, it's going to select all the keyframes beneath, but I can also click another level up. So if I click up here, it'll grab every keyframe from every object on whatever frame number we're at. And likewise, we can click up here and it will grab everything in the scene that has a keyframe on it there. Now this is getting very complicated and if you find yourself getting overwhelmed, it's okay. I'm going a tiny bit deeper than necessary for those people that want to explore kind of deeper animation after taking this course. For now though, let's go take a look at the graph editor. So we're gonna come up here and we're gonna go under the animation tab there and we're going to go to the graph editor here. And you see that nothing's appearing because we have this only show selected. So if I click this, you can see the animation curves for everything in the scene. You can see that it gets quite messy very quickly. So we're going to go only show selected to make that a little bit simpler. And let's look at this arm. So we have this arm here. And if I press A, I'll select everything. Or you can click and drag to select everything. And if I press period on my number pad, it'll kind of zoom in to whatever we have there. I'm gonna go ahead and drag this window over a bit so we can see it more. So if I twirl this down, we know that we're not necessarily affecting the location or the scale of the arms, and you can see all those flat curves there. And that basically tells us that those don't have any animation on it. And whereas we see all these curves moving wildly, those are actually the rotation. If we click that, you can see which one is selected. So what if we wanna hide these things? And this also works in the dope sheet. So if you twirl this down, you can actually toggle the visibility. So if we go ahead, we can click and drag and we can turn off the scale and we can turn off the location and then we'll be left with only the rotation keyframes to see. And you can see here that it's the easing between keyframes. So if the easing doesn't make sense now, we're going to cover this more in the ball bouncing, but it basically controls the speed from moving from one frame to the next. So for example, if we look at this little arm right here, and I'm just gonna do a quick example here. If we grab all three of these, and I come up here and I scale this, you'll see that it's kind of broadening. So what it's gonna do is snap really quickly up to this number and then kind of slowly go down. And you can see if I do that here, how it starts to kind of slow down the arm, but if I scale it all the way in, you'll see that the arm just kind of snaps. And the arm's a very quick example, so it's kind of harder to see here. This will make a lot more sense when I show it on the ball bouncing example. So that's how you can adjust the easing of keyframes, and that's where we can really start to kind of polish our animation. Again, don't get too overwhelmed now. We'll only be doing this a little bit with one or two bones, and we'll keep it pretty simple. Now what I did up here is a bounding box in Invigital Centers. So here, bounding box will grab the bounding box around all this so that if I scale, it'll scale everything like that. Individual origins will only scale at each point. So if you see that, it just scales the handles in and out. Again, we'll be using that later and hopefully once using it in context, it'll make a bit more sense. I can go ahead and I can turn all these back on. I can also turn visibility of everything on and then you can toggle the visibility of each object with these eyeballs if you prefer doing it that way. I find that the graph editor just gets too messy so I tend to just use the only selected option. 
With that, that kind of gives us a basic overview of the animation interface in Blender. So we've looked at the basic tools and we've looked at the basic process, and now we're going to go ahead and apply those to our first animation. We're gonna start with the classic ball bounce, which I know is very boring, but I promise we'll get to the cool characters later. I added a little face to it to hopefully make it a little more interesting, and it's a great way to learn on something simple before diving into something more complex. So let's get started with our first animation in Blender. So here we are in the ball bouncing animation project file. So if you're following along, make sure to open that project file. We're going to start by applying the basics that we've learned to this ball bounce. So here we have our dope sheet. Here we have our timeline. Here we have our camera view. Here we have our render settings. And then here we have the ball. I'm viewing it in the front view here. So what we're going to do is animate this character bouncing. We're also going to talk about squash and stretch in this video. So squash and stretch is one of the 12 principles of animation. They're invented by the Disney animators way back when they first began animating, and they've long since been studied. This course will cover squash and stretch, and it will also cover secondary motion. If you'd like to learn all 12 principles of animation, I've included a link in the resources. So squash and stretch basically says that we will squash and stretch portions of our character to exaggerate the motion and to communicate character and motion through our in-between frames. So in this case, we'll make the ball squish when it hits the ground, and then when it launches up, we'll make it stretch to add more character. So let's go ahead and first focus on blocking out our character. But first, we need to actually go ahead and turn on auto keying and set up a keying set. So let's go ahead, turn on auto keying. Let's come over here to keying grab this list here and click location and scale because we only plan to use location and scale. We'll go to the drop down menu and we'll make sure only active keying set is turned on. Now what we need to do is insert some keyframes. So we want this to loop as an animation. So let's go ahead, let's insert a keyframe on frame 28. So grab your ball and press I and you'll see that it inserts keyframes there. Let's go ahead up here to one, let's press I and that'll insert keyframes there. Then we can come over here to 14 and insert a keyframe there. So now we kind of have three keyframes that we can work with. So let's go ahead on 28, let's grab the move tool, then let's grab this little blue arrow and we're gonna move our character up. So let's make them bounce pretty high. So I'm gonna move them up to there. Then what we'll see if we play our animation is that it stays still and then snaps up. And that's because these two keyframes have no change. So it's not going to change in between them, but then we have a change there. And we want this to loop. So one thing we can actually do is click here at the top of our summary, which will duplicate all the keyframes there or grab all the keyframes there. And then if we hit shift D, we can duplicate those keyframes and take them over until they cover that first keyframe. And now that same data will be there and we'll actually have kind of a bouncing animation. So let's go ahead and play there. So this is part of the blocking phase. And what we're doing is trying to figure out where the character is going to be in the scene. So we know we want our character to go that high and we know them to land on this kind of red line here as a ground plane. So that's kind of blocking out our character's motion there. So next we're gonna move forward on doing some keyframe poses. So we wanna introduce squash and stretch. So when they hit the ground, we want them to squish and when they go up in the air, we want them to stretch. So let's go ahead and first we'll add some squash. So on frame 14, we're going to grab this scale tool here and we're going to grab this blue icon here and we're going to squish that down. But you see that doesn't look realistic because we have to think about our character's volume and we just got rid of a lot of our character's volume. So what we can do is actually go to top view. So I'm gonna click this little Z here. And what we can do is drag out on the Y a bit and we can drag out on the X a bit then we can click this little green dot here and it'll take us back to our front view. And we can see that it looks a lot more realistic. So let's see what that looks like. We can see that it's scaling down our character the whole time, which is not what we want. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to frame eight here and we're going to press Alt S. And what that's going to do is remove any scaling we have here. So if we press Alt S, you'll see that it pops our character back to its normal scale we come up here to frame 20, we'll hit Alt S again. And again, it's put our character back to the normal scale. So let's go ahead and hit play now. We can see that that's starting to look better, but that the easing's still off. The timing's good though, so we can fix the easing in the last phase and really polish off the timing to make that work. 
So what we'll do here is we'll come to frame eight and now we're going to introduce stretch. So at this point, we want the ball to begin stretching. So we're gonna go ahead and grab this ball and we'll grab the little blue there. And on frame eight, we're going to bring this up so that it looks like it's stretching. So almost like it's smearing straight up. And then to save ourselves some time, we can actually grab this keyframe here by box selecting it, duplicate it and bring it over to 20. And that'll give us the same keyframe there. So we can see that it's starting to look a little bit more natural and like it has some movement. This of course doesn't look great, but we do have the timing down and the blocking down. So now it's time to take a look at how we can adjust the easing to make this feel much more natural. So let's come up here and we're going to go over to the graph editor. And we can see that we have a spaghetti noodle mess of options here. So what we're going to do is twirl this down here and we see we have location and scale. So first things first, let's work on the location at first. So I'm actually going to use the eyeball here to toggle off the scale so that we can focus on the location. We can see that we only have this one graph here with all the motion. So if I grab X, I can see there's no motion. And if I grab Y, I can see there's no motion because in this case, we're moving up and down on the Z axis. So I'm actually going to grab Y and press delete to get rid of that. And then I'm going to select X and then I'm going to delete that. This gives me one thing to focus on. Now, if you can't really see it in your view and you're zoomed in too far or too close, you can actually box select everything or press A to select everything. And if you press period on your numpad, it'll zoom in, making it a little bit easier. So let's begin editing this to give it a more natural flow. So right now when we're playing, the problem we're having is that it's just bouncing up and down at the same speed, making it look like it's floating. Whereas what we want to do is we want the ball to hit the ground, to hold, and then to pop back up quickly, hang in the air to lose its momentum, and then to slowly drop down before gaining momentum and smashing into the ground again. So what this does in the graph editor, it shows us the speed from one keyframe to the next. And right now we can see that's pretty much the same speed throughout. It slows down a tiny bit here and pops right back up at the same speed. So what we'd want that to look like more is more like this, where it's gonna hit the ground and hold. So what we're going to do is come up here to bounding box, change this to individual centers, and first let's affect how it holds in the air. So with individual centers on, it will scale at each one independently. So if I grab these, you can see that it'll scale at those independently. If it was on bounding box and I scale, we'll see that it just kind of moves those out and get bigger. So that's the difference there. Turn it on to individual centers. And what we're going to do is press S, then X, and then that'll allow us to scale this way. And we're just gonna scale that up so that those kind of come in. Now, when we hit play, we'll see that it's holding in the air much longer, maybe a little bit too much. So I'm gonna release that scale and you can see now it's got a little bit more of a natural float in the air. Now the scaling's kind of throwing off our perspective, making it difficult to really see how the float, but it'll look a bit better once we adjust the scaling. Now we need to make it look like it's snapping into the ground. So we actually want him to hit the ground almost around here. So if we go ahead and we grab this and we scale it up, we can make it so that he's almost snapped into the ground by frame 10. Now let's go ahead, go back and hit play. You can see that's starting to look a lot more natural, but we need to adjust the scale for it to really fit. Now that the location's looking natural, let's focus on the scale to really sell the effect. So what we can do is come up here, turn off visibility of Z location, turn on visibility of Z scale, and we can see our scale graph here. And we can see that the scale is kind of just not necessarily matching the timing of the ground. What we want to do is that as it hits the ground, we want it to snap down quickly. So we know that he hits the ground around frame 10 to 11. So it's kind of in between there. So let's come up here to frame 10. Let's grab this on the bottom, this keyframe here, and then let's scale this up until this value almost reaches there. So what that's going to do is make it look that as soon as he hits the ground, it snaps down, slowly squishes, and then begins to pop back up before going out. So right now this still doesn't look super natural because we actually have some unnecessary easing right here where it converts from one to the other and we're going to get rid of that. So what you would wanna do is grab this handle and rotate it, but you can see that that adjusts both sides. So what we're going to do is we're going to grab both of these and we're going to change the handle type. 
Now it's buried up here in the menus under handle type and you can go down to vector. And you'll see that now we can grab these handles and move them independently of one another. Unfortunately, we can see it's also screwed up our graph shape. So let's just go ahead and bring that back a bit. So we'll grab that handle and I'm gonna use the G key just to move it. You can also just grab and drag it. So we'll move that up a bit. We'll go over here and we'll grab this handle and move this up a bit. And that should already begin looking more natural. Let's again go to frame 10 and make sure that it's not really fully scaled down until then. Now if we play it back, we can see it's already looking a bit more natural. Now I think we can grab both of these handles here. We can scale those up ever so slightly to make this animation a bit snappier. So what it's going to do is hold natural up here and then snap into that stretch a little quicker. And we can even scale that up a bit more. Let me click out so you can get a good view of my F curve here. So now if we play, we can see that it hits the ground, squishes, and then stretches on its snap up and on its drag down. Now here I can see that the squash is actually coming in too soon. So we can go ahead and we can grab this bottom frame and we can scale that in to remedy that a bit. So let's go ahead, hit play, and that feels much more natural. Now it looks great in the front view, but if we come out, we'll see that because we haven't adjusted the other scales yet, that those aren't mashing as naturally. So what we're gonna do is come back into front view, we'll grab our ball, and then we're going to turn on the X and Y scale. And we wanna just make sure that these match a little bit better. So we can grab both of these here and we can adjust multiple curves at once. So we're gonna hit R, we're going to rotate that there, and we can grab these and rotate that there. And it's okay if there's a little bit of movement here. In this case, that might make it look a little bit more natural. Now, if you don't remember and you're having a hard time following along, remember that I'm just grabbing everything and pressing S to scale, and that's how I'm doing that. So let's go ahead and leave the curve right around there and see how that looks. That looks pretty natural. And with that, we have our first ball bounce.